Welcome chemistry students. At this point in time in unit three, we have covered the atom and the different parts that make up the atom and how to count them with the mole. Here in unit four, we're gonna take a look at the electron and how its interactions with light and energy help us understand more about the structure of the atom. We've already talked about the history of the atom and the timeline that kind of helps us adjust our atomic model. In this section, we're gonna take a look here toward the end of that timeline and how the end of that timeline gets us into quantum mechanics and the idea of the electron and how it's positioned around the nucleus. Historically, before the 1900s, scientists typically thought about light as waves. It was not matter and it traveled in different frequencies and different wavelengths. This is how we see the electromagnetic spectrum, everything from gamma rays all the way down to radio waves and microwaves. Visible light, which is located here on the electromagnetic spectrum, has red all the way to violet. That's how we get Roy G. Biv. You may have remembered from your physical science class, we have wavelength, amplitude, and frequency. These are some of the measurements we can take about a wave. Typically speaking, wavelength and frequency are inversely proportional. So as the frequency of the wave increases, as it becomes more frequent, the wavelength gets smaller. Okay, frequency increases, wavelength decreases, and vice versa. Amplitude is how much energy the wave has, and typically will be a measurement of how far this wave gets from the baseline. The more energy you put into the wave, the farther away that wave will crest or trough away from the midline. The thing that's interesting about electromagnetic waves is it's actually two perpendicular waves. One is on the electric axis and one is on the magnetic axis, hence electromagnetic. You can see here in this picture, we have the electric field and the magnetic field, both part of that wave. And this is why we call it the electromagnetic spectrum. We only see visible light, which is a very small part of that spectrum. But you can see we have high energy waves like gamma, x-ray, and ultraviolet. Typically, we think of those as the more dangerous types of waves. They have um, higher frequencies and have the ability to mutate DNA and things like that. And then we have infrared, microwaves, and radio waves down at the other end of the spectrum. So now we can start to ask some questions here. Gamma radiation is high energy, which means it's also high frequency, which would also be low wavelength. So it says which has the longest wavelength? So that would be the one that's furthest to the left. So red light or blue light? Well, it's going to be red light in this case. What about x-rays or microwaves? Well, microwaves would be farther to the left than x-rays, so microwaves would be what we're looking for there. And then violet light or UV rays. So here's violet, which is right here, and then ultraviolet would be here. So the violet light would have a longer wavelength than the ultraviolet. Then it asks which one has the highest frequency. This would be the ones that are closest to the right. So gamma rays would be farther right than infrared. And green light would be farther right than orange. So therefore green light has a higher frequency than orange light. Which has the lowest energy? The low energy is down on this end. We have visible light or microwaves. So microwaves would actually have lower energy. And then we have UV or cosmic rays. Cosmic rays are very high frequency rays that comes from outer space. And therefore UV rays would have a much lower energy than cosmic waves. So what does the electromagnetic spectrum and these energy waves have to do with electrons around the atom? When electrons interact with that light, that energy, they can either stay at the ground state, which is where they're currently located, or they can jump up to a higher energy level at the excited state. So if you look, we can see that we have a Bohr model here. This is a model that Bohr came up with that showed where the electrons were, how they are arranged in energy levels around the nucleus. So N1 is the first energy level and N2 is the second energy level. Well, if an electron is at the ground state, that would be at the place where it's normally organized. So if it's normally at N1, if that's the energy level that it's typically in, that's where it would stay. But the energized state would be if that electron gained enough energy that it would actually jump up to a higher energy level. We call that the excited or energized state. 
And then at some point, that energized electron would fall back down to the ground state and it would emit a color. These colors are what we call the atomic emission spectra. They are unique for every element. So as long as you energize the electrons of any atom, you're gonna get a unique spectra based on that atom. That's really important and really helpful because it helps us identify elements based on their unique atomic emission spectra. One way we can observe this is through something called a spectrometer. A spectrometer basically is kind of like a prism that shows us the different wavelengths that a source is emitting. In class and in lab, we will demonstrate different atomic emission spectra. But if you look right here, this kind of gives you an idea of different elements and their different spectra. Here is hydrogen, and you can see there's some, a red spectra and some blue and purple. Okay, here's helium, and you can see that that has some, a little different spectra, different colors that are being emitted from that atom. And we can go all the way down to mercury and uranium and look at the spectra of those elements that are a little larger. Notice that the sun, which gives off white light, has very few holes in the spectra. It's giving off all the different wavelengths that we see, all the different colors that we see. If we go back a slide, you can see that this is what provides evidence for the composition of stars. This is how we know what our sun is made out of and what's going on inside of our sun because of the emission of the light that's being produced by the nuclear fusion within those stars. Helium was actually discovered before we found it here on Earth because of the atomic spectra that was being emitted from the stars in outer space. Hopefully that gave you some background about how atomic spectra can help us understand more about the electrons around the atom. It's important to know that every element has its own unique atomic spectra and that's what helps us identify those elements. We can do this in a lab setting typically by something called a flame test where we put a solution of the element in a fire and a flame and then we watch those energized electrons jump up and as they fall back down they emit a color and we can actually visibly see those colors. We will do some of these demonstrations and look at some of these elements in class and in a lab setting. Good job today. Keep up the good work. We'll see you on day two of Unicorn.